So, <gasps> to celebrate the first episode of the the new 250. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have upped the polygon count of Ooh. our podcast. Ooh. Look around you. <gasps> oh, wow. Yep. As you'll observe, only the one parrot. Whoa. Or the other polygon. <laughs> Greetings, strangers, queer and pleasant. I'm not Laura Kate Magnetdale. And I'm not Jane Eyre Magnetdale. And welcome to another episode of Queer and Pleasant Strangers. Here's a podcast where two queer trans women, we have a bit of a catch up about our weeks and do silly voices we and do. skits and talk about media, what we have consumed. Yeah. How are you doing? How am I doing? Well, I'm sore and itchy. <laughs> ah, yes, you got <laughs> your new tattoo. <laughs> um, well, that's the itchy part, yes. Yeah. I have reached the shedding stage. <laughs> so, uh, yes, um, I'm, 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 I'm really appealing right now. <laughs> but yes, um, I do have a new tattoo. I'm, I'm, I'm good about that. But yes, um, I will talk about the other thing during a skit because ah. I wrote a skit around. What about, what about you? How are you doing? I'm currently playing what, What's Up With My Body Roulette, where every day we get a new random ailment. Whoop, whoop. Gotta love having a corporeal form. No. I mean, I you know, there is one good thing about having a corporeal form. It means I can interact with video games. What have you played this week? Oh, I was going to say butt touching. But I yeah. mean butt touching too. <laughs> butt touching too. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what have you been playing? Uh, not much, I'll be honest. In yeah. fact, I'm going to talk about the ailment that I sort of alluded to earlier. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we did a lot of sk skits about overworking ourselves <laughs> last week. <laughs> yep. Uh, I worked myself to the point where I had a massive carpal tunnel flare up and Oops. haven't really been able to play much of anything at all. Because, no. uh, yeah, hand not do good. Yeah. It was yeah. it was even worse because it was like, ah, yes, I have a left hand splint for my hand. I've had that for a while yeah. because that's usually the hand I, I have the most carpal tunnel issues with. Oh, no, now I have a right hand flare up. Woo! Oopsie doodle. Thanks. Well, but, yeah. but I've not played a lot. But we did play Scythe. We, 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 we played, a, played a round of Scythe. It's been a while since we've played Scythe. Yeah, it was good um, to get it out. We've, we've talked about this game before. It is a board game where you... It is in sort of an alternate history uh, 1900s. It's the 1920 plus um, universe, yes. which there are several ga other games in. And, like, I think there's books and stuff as well. Yeah, what, what if in the 1920s we invented s steam-powered mechs and now war has steam mechs? Yeah. Uh, diesel pump. Well, it's diesel like, pump. Yeah, um, diesel, yeah, diesel. Apologies, but... Huh? Yeah, low-tech low mechs. Um, yeah, low-tech mech. Yeah. I am always surprised with that game how good a job there is of, like, starting with completely random factions in completely random locations... Random extra objectives and bonuses that your character can do. How well balanced it is for like very comparable scores by the end. Mm -hmm. I always appreciate a game where you can play two very different ways and still be neck and neck. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's good to be able to play in uh, like a different variety of ways. It's nice to have just uh, like... Different strategies every time. Obviously, you've got the way that you've got uh, your faction board, which defines how your mechs move and what sort of mech power-ups you get. And then you've got your um, industry board, I guess you would call it, which sort of sets out how much things are going to cost to do, how much uh, you're going to get as a bonus for doing certain bottom, bottom row actions. Because you've got, obviously, the top row actions are just, like, ones you can do. It might be pay a gold to get two resources or mm. produce resources in a place where you have workers on the board and then like every action has uh, each of the four actions has a bottom row action which will be something like build a building which will yeah. give you some ongoing benefit or build a mech which is sort of your primary moving things around unit and also um defense Mm. As is often the case in a two-player game, we didn't end up doing any fighting. No, like we, the only time I can really think of that we've in a two-player game done fighting inside is when we played through the sort of campaign. Yes, when we played through Rise of Fenris, there was uh, a couple of missions where it was 
sort of Somewhat, pushed towards yeah. being a bit fighty. Difficult to avoid. Yes. But that that is the nature of, of um that particular um campaign, legacy campaign. Uh, but also good fun that it's you know, that could be modules to play in any regular game, or it can be entirely resettable. To the point where we've reset our copy and lent it to someone. Yeah. So uh, it's it's nice to have that option. But <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoy Scythe. It was nice to get it out. We played with the the extended board, so everything is a bit bigger. Yeah. Which means you can fit more things in a hex without worrying about it all tumbling over into the other adjoining places. Indeed. Uh, we also played with the Invaders from Afar expansion. Yeah. So you were playing, uh, what, Crimea? Yep. So yeah, you were in yellow with the cool um like traction engines with little leggies at the front. Yeah. And I was playing as Albion. The mm. first time I've tried uh, Albion, which is um they they've got sort of like almost portable artillery cannons. Yeah. Rather than sort of the more traditional sort of mechs. They've got little leggies and they're kind of tubby and they've yeah. just got like like the whole top portion is just like a, a huge um like artillery gun. Yeah. It's um yeah, it's it's interesting. They have this whole uh thing of uh exulting. You put down flags and if you control those areas at the end of the game, you get to uh mark as basically score those areas double. Mm. Which is uh, a nice little bonus. Yeah. And you've also got the fact that you can one of your mech abilities allows you to basically move to any position where you've got a worker or or a flag down so it's quite good for sort of nipping around cleaning up bits or if if i'd found myself in sudden danger mm. sort of being able to like ping things around yeah my workers are in danger not to worry i'll send in a meg or three T yeah but um yeah it was it was nice to try something a bit different and yeah. uh yeah I always enjoy a bit of scythe. What about you? You play tons of things. Uh I, I, I've got a lot of things I'm going to rattle through. I need to, I need to have an early-ish night tonight, so I'm going to, I'm going to rattle through some. So I started by playing what I thought was going to be the final two uh, playdate games of season one. Mm -hmm. uh, the playdate being my little, uh, little handheld game console with a little crank on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, so I finished my three months of getting two games every Monday. Uh, the final two were Ratcheteer and B360. Uh, Ratcheteer is a sort of top-down Zelda-esque uh, sort of um, dungeon dungeon exploration-y kind of game mm -hmm. um, that is set deep underground in a mining colony mm -hmm. uh, where you have to use the crank occasionally to uh, uh, crank up your lantern to get more light. Okay. Uh, so you're sort of doing some like Zelda-esque stuff with limited light av availability initially. Mm -hmm. um, you eventually get a weapon and you start doing some exploration stuff. There's some neat puzzle-solving ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty early on in it, but there's some neat puzzle-solving ideas around the um, the lantern as a mechanic. Um, like one in particular was like deliberately turning out the lantern so everything's very dark and they were these sort of moles uh, going back and forth across a path you needed to follow, and this was before I had a weapon. Mm -hmm. um, but whenever you, like, turned the lantern on by, like, cranking it quickly, it would startle the mole and they'd stay in position. So you had to sort of watch in the dark until they were sort of out of the way of the path and then quickly turn the lantern on so they'd get startled not in the path and uh -huh. you could sort of walk, walk through safely. Uh, little things like that with some fun early puzzle ideas, and I'm curious where they're going with it, but... Mm -hmm. It is a neat little game. Um, the other one is B360, which is easier to explain. It is basically Breakout, but but a sphere. Um, okay. You are using the crank to move your paddle um, in a in a, a circ in a circle. Okay. Um, there are bricks in the middle. You are trying to break the bricks in the middle by you know every time the ball sort of goes and hits something in the middle and bounces off in a direction turning the crank to get into the right position to like on the inside of a curve try and get the right bounce angle to hit the bricks you okay. need it is more difficult than you would imagine uh the the change from a flat paddle where you only have to think about like th it's at this angle and i move a little left or right to sort of angle it yeah you have to think about 
physics very differently in your head for this. Mm. Um, it is a fun little game. It's another one of those ones on the, the season one I played it that's like a thing you know with a little bit of a twist that is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, but while I'm on this, I will sort of jump ahead to... Turns out those aren't the first, uh, the, the last free games for Playdate Season 1. What? Uh, what, what? What wild timing on my part. This week, finally finished Season 1 of Playdate, mm -hmm. um, and then they did a little presentation today, um, and I'll like very quickly jump on it, uh, that was like, hey, there's now like a curated store of games in the Playdate, if you mm -hmm. want to like buy games that we have gone yeah that's a really good game we, we recommend it you can buy it through the playdate um i also grabbed a bunch of games off of uh, itch.io but the other thing was they were like hey two more two more free games for season one of playdate nice. uh so the two new ones were called real steel r-e-e-l like reeling in a fishing yeah. line uh and recommendation dog uh Guide me over Recommendation Dog. Yeah, Recommendation Dog is like, I love the idea, I'm not good enough at it. Right. Um, it's, it's kind of like, what if Papers, Please was less depressing? <laughs> um, because it's a very, it's very similar, quickly, quickly look through a lot of forms and paperwork type thing. Right. You are a dog that has set up an office where you have a little roller deck of like, people that might be good employees to send out on jobs. Right. And people come in with very weird specific niche requests they'll rush into your office and be like i urgently need um i am a, i am a magician and i need a fellow magician to help me at a party i need a magician with low cost and high charisma and you've got to like flick through your rolodex really quickly on a timer and find someone who matches the profession and like this stat is high and this stat is low uh okay. And, and sort of hand it over before they get too pissed off and run uh, and leave. Okay. It's that it, it's very papers please in that sort of like I'm trying to very very quickly process a lot of essentially ID information. Yeah. Um, on a time limit and that gets very fr frantic. But it's a lot less depressing because you are just like a dog doing their best. You're like, look, if I if I fail, I am a dog. I'm. It, I'm just a dog. I'm Why just, are you I'm making me dog. capitalism? Exactly. Slow down. Uh, the other one. Uh, Real Steel is a game about anti-capitalism and yes. stealing from billionaires in which uh, you go on heists lowered in on a on a fishing line okay. uh, from the ceiling. Um, so early on, the gimmick is basically like you are trying to get to the bottom of like uh, the, the, the very first level is there is a some politician who's going to sign into law some bill that uh, defunds the arts. Yeah. And you're like, if I can break into his, all the way down into the bottom of his vault and steal that, that piece of legislation before he hands it over, it's going to slow down his ability to defund the arts. Uh, ah. it's, it's at least temporarily going to keep the arts funded. Yeah. Um, you use the crank to go up or down to sort of lower or raise your fishing line. Mm -hmm. And you're automatically sort of swaying sort of left and right, but you can use a button to sort of like change the current direction you're, you're lilting. Okay. Um, and you are trying to avoid uh, like security measures that are trying to catch you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of like, there'll be like collectible bags of money and you'll know how many there are in a level and you can try and get bonuses by collecting a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. There will be objectives per level that are things like get a medal for getting all, the go the, all of the gold out for completing the level in X amount of time, for doing the level without getting seen at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's not too unforgiving if you um, if, if you make little mistakes. If you get, at least in the first level, if you get caught with, um, if you get caught by a security system, it's not instantly the second the cone of vision hits you, you're in trouble. It's mm -hmm. a meter starts filling and you've got a second to get out of the way. Okay, that's sort of um, like, um, I think Hitman does a similar thing where you're... Yeah, the sort of some things like caution You're in, in the suspicion area. Yeah. Uh, and even then, if you do get caught, what happens is you fall off the fishing line mm. and you still control the fishing line so you can sort of like quickly rush down to try and grab the person and you might have to work your way back up to whatever bag of gold you were trying to get at the time. Okay. Uh, but like, it's not a game over. It's like, hey, go find your person and like regroup from wherever you are now. Nice. But that might stop you getting the didn't get seen achievement or whatever. Mm. It has a good sense of humour and some really nice character art, some great music. Nice. It's really, really charming. Yay. Um, 
Should I just keep going with things? Yeah, I've keep going. Yeah. Um. So, uh, a couple couple of other things I played. I did some more shiny hunting in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. I am now four shiny species away from being done with that game. I dipped back in. It's four. It's four fish species, and fish are really annoying to shiny hunt in this game because the shiny boosting odds sandwiches boost per type of Pokemon. Right. And everything out in the ocean is a water type. And these four Pokemon left I need to find are just water types. They right. don't have like a secondary typing, which means that I'm making everything in the ocean more common, not the thing I'm looking for. Uh, that's not helpful. Yeah, because like if, if this if some of them I were looking for were say water slash fighting, yeah. I could do a fighting odds boost sandwich. And because not many water, uh, Pokemon out in the ocean are fighting types, I'd probably see a bunch of the thing I'm shiny hunting. Yeah. But monotype water? Fucking ridiculous to just shiny hunt one thing. So Do better, fish. Um, I'll, I'll get there, but I'm down to my last last handful oh, shit. until the DLC happens in a few months. And then many yeah. months. Uh, and the last thing I'll talk about quickly is I played some more uh, boss game. The final boss is my heart. <gasps> I've talked about that game on this uh, yeah. on this show before. It's all caps. Yeah. The final boss is my heart. It's it's a music rhythm boss rush game where you play a pair of trans lesbians just trying to survive capitalism by fighting demons. Hey, yes. um, right. Um, I went back and re and, and played some more of it. I need to finish it on mobile still. Um, because I wanted to stream some of it, because I was mm -hmm. like, this game is criminally underappreciated. I want to show it off. I finally worked out how to get Blue Stacks working for streaming, which is a emulate a fake Android device on your computer. Okay. Uh, and then I sort of worked out how to map my controller to virtual touchscreen buttons. So, mm -hmm. like, I press this controller button, it touches the touchscreen here in a way that made sense logically. Um, if only there was some kind of Android-based touchscreen uh, computer game console system. <laughs> Imagine such a thing. Well, I mean, there is such a thing, but can I make it show up on stream? <laughs> is the question. And getting getting this this was the way that seemed easiest to get it to show on stream in the end. I love that game so much. I want to go back and play it. I need yeah, to. You... I need to find time to play more of it. It's so good. <sighs> um. Yeah, I think that's the main things that I played this week. Uh, oh. Yeah, you played anything else? No, not really. Well then, time for this. Do you have a body? Yes. Do you sometimes work really hard and then at some point something happens to your body and you don't really even notice it happening? But then like, oh no, I'm either in hospital or I've done myself a massive injury and I didn't even realise because I was just, you know, working lots. Yeah. Yeah. Body hard. Try body hard. If you can't do your own interoception, stop it's fine. Aha. Uh -huh. Tell tell me m more. Look at this. This person here has been working at this computer solidly for the last 26 hours. Oh, that's no good. They haven't moved at all. They haven't had bathroom breaks. They haven't hydrated themselves. But look, if we give them the body hard, now they've become aware that their fluid oh. levels are low and they their bladder levels are very high I, I'm and their food I'm levels yeah. are very low and their sleep oh, levels are very low. Sleep, sleepiness is high and oh, oh it, it's highlighting on the body that there's an ache there. There is an ache, in fact, attention to. that they need to do some carpal tunnel exercises yeah. because that is starting to become a, a, a big issue. And we could stop that now, just about. Oh, also they have some some kind of foot fungus growing. It's only in the early stages, but they are now aware of it and hopefully they can they can deal with it. Oh, no, we've made... Made them really paranoid at uh, all the things. Okay, we're just going to turn the settings down. Body hard! It'll help you and you can't do the interoception thing properly and you don't know what's wrong or why or what's coming. <laughs> um, huh. What, 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 what is that? You're, what is that you're watching? Oh, this is one of those craft channels. This one's called Four Minute Makes. Yeah. And, you know, they'll just take a bunch of stuff. Okay, well, look, look this one, this okay. one. They right. they've got a rubber band there and a couple of popsicle sticks. Yeah, some hot glue. Quite quite a lot of hot glue yeah. actually, actually. Um, some more elastic bands. I'm seeing there, and bang! Uh, that that's a particle accelerator now. Uh, yeah, no, no, yeah, no. My confusion still stays. How? I feel like we missed a hell of a lot of steps. No, it was right. It was right there. You know, it's it's the little time wipe. 
You keep doing this thing, and then that happens. I, I, I'm not convinced. Well, what about this one? Okay, we've got uh, some cotton wool, and I think those are mustard seeds. Oh, maybe yeah. we're doing the little the little grass egg egg yeah. eggy things. Yeah. Yup, yup. And now the basement is a full hydroponic system, growing growing all all the, all the vegetables you could possibly need. We could we could do that. Yeah. Again, I've I, got some hot glue. Yeah. Again, I feel like we're gonna need more than what they showed us there. No, oh, no. I feel no, like it's... they hid some things in the in the time wipe. Uh, no, I think the, the thing. I mean, it's it's four minute makes. They can only do show so much on on the thing. And it, they, you know, obviously all the steps they show you at the beginning. Okay, well this one, right? You take an old tatty book and you remove the old cover with with like a Stanley knife, and then you get some some. I think that's maybe MDF, maybe some kind of hardboard. Yeah, and then there's like some stitching going on, and now there's the British Library. I, I, if watching this brings you joy, I'm very happy for you. I really hope you keep your expectations at the correct level. Yeah. A popsicle sticks, elastic bands, particle accelerator. If you don't believe me, watch. Wipey, 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 wipey. Uh huh. See? Particle accelerator. Okay. Yeah. Never underestimate the power of four minute makes. It's legit. I did have to spend three grand on the wipey wipey wipey. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. They do they do charge you quite a lot for the wipey wipey. So <gasps> what have you put in your eyes? Well, we put some things in our eyes. We did. Uh we watched uh episode seven of The Last of Us. Oh my yes. Uh, yeah. That was the DLC uh, episode, right? Yes, yes. Um, I'm curious for you about your thoughts first as someone that this was your first experience of that story. Yes, I mean, it's the first experience of the whole story. Yeah. Because I I'm... have not, not done any Lasting of Us. Indeed, but in particular, oh, this, mm, oh, I have feelings about this story. It, it was, it was very sad. It, 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 it made me do another cry. This series with all the feels. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that, like, I, I think they did a good job of, while not one-to-one -one recreating what the game does, uh, capturing, like, the important narrative beats of that story. Yeah. Um, like, I, 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 very spoiler light, this is the episode that really sort of gives context to why it is so important to Ellie that she be able to be the cure. Mm. And I think it it really works it's one of those things that like I'm I'm I've always been so frustrated that the original game did not include this in the main game and right. that the remake of part 1 doesn't just insert it in this point in the story where it makes sense it's still treated mm. as like an a, an extra side thing. I'm like it's so Pivotal to understanding why Ellie is as desperate as she is to to want to believe she can help. Yeah. And it's... I think they did a really good job with it. Yeah. I really like the, act, uh, the, uh, the actor they had for uh, Riley. I thought Riley was fantastic. I, I mean, I, I, I have no point of reference, but I enjoyed the riley -ing. Yeah. It's... It was It was all very... It, it was... It it captured that thing that the Walking Dead um, uh, Telltale game did really well of just being like really heavy going, but still gripping and interesting. Yeah, because I think it would be easy to get sort of worn out on that kind of thing, yeah. but I think they 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 do a very good job of of making yeah. you care about the characters and um and and, and even in what like. 40 50 minute episode yeah. to just be like we're gonna tell this story now and yeah we're we're gonna introduce a new character that you've never seen before but also we're going to break your heart have fun yeah. i i think what episode seven in particular does very well is it doesn't feel too bogged down in the misery because of the fact that like it spends most of its runtime in this weird situation of this is lovely, this is wonderful, we know this isn't going to last. Mm. And that sort of just looming knowledge on the edge of your vision until so close to the end. Yeah. Like, they don't drag out the ending. It's just 
let's really, really get to get to know these people before what happens happens. Yes, and uh, and also with a sense of what happens next. Yeah, because uh, tr- trying to keep spoiler light, yeah. like it doesn't necessarily provide a solid con- conclusion. Mm. So either that works very well as a we've left a thing unspoken. Yeah. Or a, a um maybe we will get back to it in episode eight, I guess. Which yeah. I think is out, but we haven't seen it yet. Episode eight is out, we just haven't had time to watch it yet. Yeah, but busy busy. Yeah. They 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 did a good job, I think. I I've genuinely gen- genuinely been really impressed at how, how good a job they've done with The Last of Us, and particularly how good a job they've done of like using very little of the action moments from the game and still making it feel like a cohesive story. They did the photo booth bit. That's a bit I know. Yep. They're good. Good for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about you? You watched anything else this week? Uh, it's not been a watch-heavy week for me either. I watched a couple of things, though. I did did make some effort. I was like, well, if I can't play anything, I'm going to sit here and stare at stuff. And some of the stuff I have stared at, I, I watched... Um, a video on the Venus Theory YouTube channel called mm-hmm. Expo- Exploring the Depths of Extreme Convolution Reverb. Mm-hmm. And it's about Venus Theory and uh, I think the other guy's name is Ben Johnson, who also has a YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And they basically went potholing down a uh, down in some caves. Mm-hmm. There are some caves that exist. They are like not really they're not like a tourist attraction or anything Mm. this is potholing about as a dangerous and dire as it gets yeah and it's like okay well there's us Mm. and 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 we're here and we've got a bunch of recording equipment and we're gonna go 500 feet underground through some very tight caves and try not to fall in some flooded areas of the caves, and not fall down holes, and not cause ourselves any uh, or or too much injury, while also going. Let's record some cool, um, res- like uh, reverberation responses Ooh. for sound design, and and make cool, fun sound stuff. Fascinating. Um, apparently those those convolutions are going to be released. Uh, and I think some of the, some of them are even going to be free for people who own FL Studio, like me. Yay! Neat. So yeah, we'll we'll be able to get some some cool cave music going, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, it was a fascinating video of hey, what happens when your friend just goes, hey, how tall are you? <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're on the other side of the country preparing to go caving <laughs> with some recording equipment. See and and the the fear of I mean we've told people where we're going, yeah. but we're basically there on our own. And if something happens, we're fucked. That's that's caving <laughs> for you. Yeah, <laughs> and all then also like getting all that on the ground and going. Yeah, there's a lot of rock above us, isn't there? That's a whole lot of rock above us. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I've never been interested in it, and and just watching most of that video, just like you don't nah. want to have a stare down with the buried. Uh, it's not the buried that bothers me; it's the tight passages. Like yeah. I don't mind being in a cave underground. I don't really mind being underground that much. I don't mind being specifically buried, yeah. but it's the getting through a narrow passage. Yeah. I have Winnie the Pooh based fears. Yeah. Uh, as, as as somebody who has always been overweight for my entire life, like that, I think has has some bearing on it. Very, Just the concept yeah. of what if I get stuck? Ah, uh, understandable. Mm-hmm. What about you? What have you watched? Ah, uh, I watched a video on YouTube called the Yu-Gi-Oh manga that plays by the rules by uh, Uncrowned Jewels. Okay. Uh, so this is a uh, twenty-five minute long video about a manga series that has never been translated into English officially, but there are, like, fan translations out there. Right. Um, that is a, a Yu-Gi-Oh! series not set in the world of, like, ancient pharaohs and, and magical artifacts and god god cards and magic abilities. Okay. It is set in the real world, and it follows um, a young, young teenager, um, g- like, trying to get into competitive Yu-Gi-Oh!, in their local card gaming scene. 
uh, like going to local small scale tournaments, okay. um, learn like learning deck building best practices, um, and it has a lot of the like anime over the top nonsense of the, the 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 sort of anime, but grounded in a world of these characters are using like ra- rather than in like the Yu Gi Oh anime where you'll often see characters use completely not optimized decks because they want the fight to be a dramatic exciting back and forth for ages mm-hmm. uh, that they can stretch out here having characters uh, people using like modern competitive deck archetypes and learning how to do the uh, how, how to do the thing that that deck archetype does uh it's it's really interesting because it seems to from what i've i've, I've seen of it cover a lot of like the interpersonal stuff of interpersonal dynamics at card uh, at, like trading card game tournaments okay. and things like um the the main character at their first like oh if i lose this i drop out of the tournament um match having the nerves that start to set in and misplaying and forget like oh shit i knew you had that card face down you had to show me it before you put it down and I did the thing anyway, I forgot you'd put it there and I fucked myself over because I was too nervous. Uh, through uh, through to things like uh, competitive meta strategy. Um, there was one, uh, one match in it I was looking through that was um, uh, very much focused on this card that is banned in the English version of the game but is legal in the Japanese version called Max C. Okay. Um, which is a card where once... You play it, any time your opponent special summons a monster that turn, you get to draw a card. And because Yu-Gi-Oh is such a special summon heavy game, mm. what it's trying, the, the intent is that you go, oh no no, you can keep doing your turn as you planned, but like, I'm going to draw a shit ton of cards if you do. Yes. Um, uh, and sort of following in this match, this being played against the main character and them having to go, do I coward out and back down, or do I think I have the cards I need in my hand to win this turn so that my opponent drawing a bunch of cards won't come back to bite me in the arse? Hmm. It's a really interesting little story from what I've seen. Um, I understand why it hasn't been localized, and it's because it is themed around the OCG, which is the like the, the Japan, Korea, China uh, version of the game, which has some tweaked rules, it has some... Uh, some light changes to ban lists and things, okay. and I can understand them not wanting to bring a thing that is so specifically about this is what it likes to pl- uh, it's like to play the game to a region where the game is a little different. Mm. But I'm really intrigued by the concept, and I really wish this would get like an anime adaptation because I love, I love, you I love see TG's TCG anime rival. Yeah, I I love TCGs, and I love st- I I love. St- the idea of a story about people actually playing a TCG without like, ah, the heart of the cards allowed me to draw exactly the card I mm-hmm. needed. No, instead it's like, no, 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 I've got to get my deck. I've got to um, shuffle up and play. I've, I've got to get my deck building ratios right so that like the chances are pretty good that I'll get what I need rather than relying on ancient mystical magic to yeah. pull what I need. And uh, yeah, other, other stuff that seemed interesting. Uh, characters don't stick with just like one deck where they're like, I am the blue eyes duelist i am the dark magician mm-hmm. duelist they're like you'll see people like trying out new things and like completely changing out archetypes characters that have this is the one deck i generally play but occasionally i'll just be like no nah, i'm subbing something new in this is um, my sideboard <laughs> yeah it's it's a really interesting thing and it's gotten me interested in that manga and i mm. i hope that it sees some more love Mm-hmm. Um, what about you? What about me? I watched uh, mostly musical thing, musical based things once again. Uh, well, technically, we watched this together. This is called the uh, topography and and the shape oh, of sounds yes. uh, on the Red Ring Means Recording Channel. Yeah, uh, where Jeremy basically talks about the shape of things, like mm. mountains and hills and valleys and rivers, and how all of that is comparable to things like sound waves and how by m- using like various additive and subtractive methods of uh, synthesis and filtering you can uh, mold those shapes and change those shapes and it's yeah. 
it's a cross between sort of an explanation of uh, synthesis in general and and sound design and almost like a, a guided meditation of because it it's got that sort of almost ASMR voice and it's kind of meandering and it's a little bit poetic but it's mm. also sort of got some interesting thoughts about the shape of sound and shaping sounds and and how that is similar to landscape and talking about like okay so we've built our landscape what if we add some reverb to it what if we put some like some starlings in the sky of of our uh, of our little landscape that we've built of of all these various aspects and yeah. uh it al- it's also it's quite a nice walk around his quite impressive modular rig uh, so yeah, it was it was a nice little. It's like a fifteen twenty minute video that's just like a, a nice trip around yeah. sound design stuff it, that, that's just done in a sort of very poetic way. Mm. Yeah. What about you? Have you watched anything else? Ah, uh, no, that's about it for me, really. Oh well then, <gasps> time for this. Got a new sponsor. Who's on new sponsor? Well, do you like the boarded games? I do. I am known to play a few. Mm, but have you played the legacy games? Oh, we've definitely played mm, some legacy games. You played them, and, and there was there was leftovers, wasn't there? I mean, there were leftovers. Filling components. filling landfills. There was so many landfills well, I mean, that you we, filled with we, all the we things. We didn't landfill those extra components. <gasps> we put them in a box, and we just like didn't know what to do with them. They just kind of sat around. Maybe we'll eventually find something to do with them. Well, today is the day that you will find something to do with it. Oh, what a coincidence. Because this week's sponsor is bitsandbobs.lol.net. It's the board game that ships with none of its own components. It just has, like, rule sheets and an empty box for you to put all your excess components from other legacy games in. Oh, those those pandemic cubes will finally have a use. That's right. Those weird little satellite dish thingies from whichever game that was. Yeah. That entire set of Lyra. From oh, viticulture yeah. that we didn't use because we've got a set of iron clays. Oh yeah, so many, so many cardboard components because like ah, we've got the the fancier version of those components. There are a few of those certainly. Yeah. Yeah. If we've just got leftover cardboard ones. All those upgraded poker chips for Cloudspire when we bought the oh, version yeah. two point yeah. upgrade. Yeah. All of that's in there. Some extra rule books and about six thousand empty baggies. <gasps> I had no idea how many baggies we were going to end up with when we go into this hobby, but here we I are. I mean, it is a hobby where you accumulate baggies. Luckily, baggies play an important part in this particular game, so oh, we're going to have a big use for them. How convenient for us! It's so convenient for us. So check it out. That's bits and bobs. Net. Enter the code QMPS251 and it will give you no discount, but it will unlock the secrets of the universe. Inside the boardroom of Supremacy Software. Hi. Hi. So, people keep complaining that, uh, you know, they want easy modes in games. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, oh. I mean, no. Yeah, right. Like, no. You look, look, I... I don't want to put easy modes in games because I have my pride as a gamer. Yeah, I mean, also, you know, I co-own the company with you and therefore, I, you know, I just have the devs leave the, the cheats open for me and me alone and everyone else will, uh, Exactly, you know, but no one else should get that. Because, no one else gets you that. You know, because only I get to be good at games. Yeah, no one else, you know, bought this company. Right, but like people keep going, eh, give us an easy mode, give us an easy mode. Right. So like, I've been thinking. What if we do what they want? We put an easy mode in, but we make it really inconvenient to access. So, like, right. we can say on the box, has an easy mode, but, like, I don't know, you have to beat the game on hard mode to unlock easy mode. Right. Or uh, you have to sacrifice all of your weapon slots to equip easy mode, and you can't equip a weapon because easy mode is in your hand. Right, yeah, you can't have a weapon, you can't, uh... You, you you can uh, gain any skills. You can't gain XP. It blocks XP. XP yeah, just pings yeah. off you. If you if you hit level, if you level up once, and it's like, oh well, you you leveled up. Clearly, you don't need easy mode. We take it away again. Oh, we could do that thing like they used to do in the nineties with uh, like uh, Genesis games. It's like, oh, you're playing on easy. Okay, here's three levels at a reduced difficulty and then the game just stops and we'll tell you you want you want you want to see the ending then you got to play the real game 
Exactly, exactly. Um, what if we have a, uh, uh, we, we put easy mode in a menu, but there's a mini game you have to play to access the menu, and it is harder than anything else in the game. Right. What if the menu was DLC, but it was all in there. The code was in there, it was all ready to go, but in order to access that menu, you have to have bought the DLC. And then have to play the hardest thing in the game, mini game. In order to win keys that may or may not be the correct key to get into the menu. You are a fucking genius. So are you. So, what have you put in your ears? Well, uh, I went back and re-listened to, because now that it's uh, it's been published, I listened to uh, the first episode of season 10 of Dice Funk. Resubian. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, which, I recorded that like three months ago, and I was like, how how much has this changed since I started three months ago? Yeah. I mean, the basics were all there. I had a very good time. I think we all did a, did a great job. I am listening going, oh, we did a lot, we, we, a lot has changed in three months of episodes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always interesting realizing how, how fast a and d campaign sometimes moves. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, season 10 of Dice Funk. This is the one that I am a DM for half of the season and a player for half the season. Yeah. Uh, the first episode that went up is uh, one of the home episodes, which mm-hmm. uh, I am a player in alongside uh leon uh renegade cut yeah and uh quinn and austin is rdm and basically this is the half of the story that is basically deep space nine mm-hmm. we've got a bunch of people on a big on a big ship out in space people sort of like living their families like a whole little community in the ship mm-hmm. sometimes there will be problems in that big ship that needs sorting this is the team of people on the ship going and solving those problems yeah and then the other the other side of the story that we'll be telling sort of like uh, in alternating arcs is the away team, which is your sort of more next generation esque uh, going down to planets and doing the sort of like things that might require people who could do a big hit if they needed to. Mm-hmm. Um, and these sort of blend together as one story told in two halves. Yeah. And I am excited that it's finally starting to get out there. Um, I... The f- first episode introduces Trizzy, which is my character, who Yay. is just uh, oily chem- chaos gremlin goblin living in the in the walls, uh, we're working on all the me- the mechanical tasks and somewhat tied into the fate of the ship uh, emotionally. Yes, uh, there is one, one way of putting it. That is a that is a s- easy way to put it. A simple way, I guess. Yeah. Um, there is Bill Webb, who is. A duck that was given human level sapience, sapience uh, by a wizard, and he very much does not like. You know, he he misses the the uh, the joy of blissful ignorance. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh no, I have the thoughts. simple bread life. Yeah, I have I have the capacity for anxiety now. I don't like it. Relatable. Um, he's a security officer. It's just an adorable duck with a knife. Uh, Sometimes you're a duck with a knife. Yeah, and Saint Cecilia, who is a uh, very, 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 very long-lived vampire, uh-huh. uh, and we're all sort of on this this ship that is basically trying to help bring uh, illithid um, al- alternative bodies for illithids that mm-hmm. don't want to forcefully take over host bodies. Right. Uh, the season is sort of exploring tofu bodies. Yeah, basically exploring a world in which. There is a growing faction of Illithids who want to integrate into wider galactic society and not be seen as mind flayers, the eaters of brains and consumers of, of unwilling hosts. and Mind friends. Yeah. Are, it, it's set in a, a setting where like trying to build that those kind of bridges is, is sort of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, I'm very happy having listened back to the first episode. Every season's a self-contained story, and the, this you can is start one of, anywhere, and this is a yeah, good place to start. This is a great place to start. It's one of my, everyone's had a long time to re, like yeah. hone their craft. It, yeah, there's a lot of recurring like older season players coming back, and this is the most most excited I've been about Dice Funk in a little while. Same. I think it's a really good place to jump in. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about you? What do you listen to this week? Uh, not a huge amount. Again, I mean. I listened to quite a lot of metal 
while getting my ink done. I couldn't tell you what any of it was. <laughs> Um, they put some drum and bass on at the end. I'm glad they left the drum and bass in, in the end because I didn't want to be fidgeting around <laughs> to that because I love me some drum and bass. Um, I started listening or randomly listened to a bunch of um, Magnus Archives episodes. Oh, yeah. I was like, you know, I, I feel the need for some some of that and there isn't any more of that. Why isn't there any more of that? Oh, no. S- soon. Soon we will get the Magnus Protocol. I'm re- so ready for that. But um, yeah, I listened to episode 160, which is the end of season, well, the last episode of season four, mm-hmm. which is uh, the big dramatic one yeah. before the uh, the final season. And my goodness, I love it. It's right where the story ramps the fuck up. It really does. Uh, so yeah, 160, 161, those, those two, um, it's, it's weird listening to them without the, what, six month gap between yeah. them, because... We were listening to it pretty much week on week from about well, I was I was picked up somewhere about what mid season four I think was was airing. Yeah. So I think that's yeah I think that's probably about where I got to the hmm. the first time through. And uh, yeah, it was nice to listen to that again. It's 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 yeah. good horror podcast. Um, and then I let back to episode uh forty forty one. And forty two, I think I listened to. Yeah. On on the way back from from Brighton, so it was, yeah, it was it was nice to listen to a bunch of yeah. random episodes of of Magnus without sort of going for anything particular, just like pick a number randomly and and doing that. Neat. I do like that show. It is and a I good am, show. I am so glad we're getting something else. Yeah. I hope that it scratches much the same itch. It's, we shall um, see. Yeah, it's it. it it feels really hard to find English speaking podcasts where they aren't predominantly American. Yes. Which uh, is fine, you know. Yeah. I listen to a lot of US podcasts, but yeah. also, you know. I get you. Give me some different accents occasionally. <laughs> but yeah, uh, what, what about you? What have you listened to? Uh, I listened to a couple of bits of music. Yes. I'll come out through those quick. Uh, I listened to a track I've heard before, but uh, I'll talk about it today. Uh, Norse Truth by Against Me. Ooh. Uh, it is very stylistically different to a lot of other Against Me music. Mm-hmm. It is a lyrically mostly spoken word in the verses. Oh, yeah. And then like very sort of like frantic, chaotic, almost screamed vocals in the chorus. Um, it is just a song about a dr- dramatic and chaotic collapse of a relationship. But it's one that is unafraid to talk about bodies and... Uh, it's unafraid to talk about bodies and specifically trans bodies with the sort of frustration and emotional rawness that like you don't get a lot in in trans uh, oh. focus songs. It is a really interesting piece of like almost verbal poetry that mm. I really enjoy. Nice. Uh, I also listen to "In an Emergency Such as the End of the World" <laughs> uh, by Chase Petra. Very grunge energy to its um, femme lyrical performance, but with a bit more like dramatic, uh, dramatic emotive rock swell in the choruses. Nice. And almost a little bit of funky bass line going through it. Nice. Um, about struggling to hold on to positives and not get pulled into overwhelming feelings of negativity. Mm-hmm. And not trying to, uh, trying to get rid of that mindset of, I have to... I have to be positive. That sort of thing of, look, hold on to the positives as you can, but like, don't beat yourself up about the negatives. You're going to feel them. That's natural. Yeah. Um, really lyrically poetic. Very, very poetic. I, I grabbed some of the lyrics because I just think it's like, it's really interestingly written. Um, in an emergency such as the end of the world, there's no point in pleasantries. Leave optimism behind. Too heavy to be. You'll find realism a lot more light. Take only the things that keep you alive. You'll see. Maybe you'll survive this thing in an emergency such as the end of the world. Mm. It's a really interestingly written track. It's it's real neat. Yeah. Uh, and I think the last track I listened to was Hypochondriac by Supercassette. Uh, Supercassette's a band I've been meaning to go back to and listen to more. Mm-hmm. Because I'd previously only heard one of their songs and it's one of my favourite songs in the last decade. Uh, it is Be Gay, Do Drugs, Hail Satan. Yeah. Um, absolutely fucking banger of a song. Nice. And I was like, I should go listen to more of their stuff. And I did. And some of it, you know, some of it was was more my taste than others. 
there's a track called Hypochondriac that is very unfiltered. Uh, it's got the energy of like local rock band that has like probably recorded in someone's makeshift at home studio. <laughs> Um, like energy wise, not necessarily production sound wise, but it's got that vibe yeah. about trying to find happy destructions from the dull background aches of life and trying not to panic about everything being the end of all things. Just it's OK to keep yourself distracted if that's what helps you move forward. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, those were some bits of music that I happen uh, that I listened to this week that, nice. that were good. Yeah. Uh, you listen to anything else? I listened to uh, Van McCoy, The Hustle. Ooh, yeah. It's like my go-to disco track. It's a regular earworm that just pops into my head all the time. It's got that good, powerful flute line that just runs through it as, as sort of a chorus constantly. And I don't know why it's always in my head, but it's always there. <laughs> and um, I like making like disco-style music. I'm not very good at it, but... Uh, I made one really good disco track, and and I've been thinking more recently, like, I want to get back to that, and thinking about one of the things a lot of people will tell you when you get started making music is recreate tracks you like. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to look at some of the, the chord structure stuff from that, because I, I feel like I get most of the, the music theory around chords, but the way I put them together doesn't always come off as terribly exciting and I'd, li I'd like to do a bit more variety with that so and and also like verse chorus type structures that I don't I don't really do a lot in my music and I probably should uh, but yeah that's love that track it's it's very upbeat the flute is real good and uh yeah I, I love disco disco is not dead baby uh have you listened to anything else uh, no, that's it for me, I think. Well then, <laughs> time for this. Hey, kids! Hi! Have you ever considered becoming a plant? What's that? It's when you appear to be in a place for normal reasons, but it turns out you're actually there to gather information. Tell me more! Well, you could... Be in a place and you could be gathering information, but what if instead of information it was nutrients? <gasps> That's right, take off your shoes, grow roots out of the bottoms of your feet, you two could be a plant. <gasps> I could be a plant? Yes, photosynthesize, that way capitalism cannot get to you. Yay! Yay! It's gonna gather sunlight and not information for the bandit. <laughs> Ah, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I've got to be honest. I am. I'm really excited for this. I've not played in years, as you know, and uh, you know, I appreciate. You know, I could go down to like the local, you know, evening <sighs> events at uh, yeah. a local friendly local game store, but you know, it's full of kids, and uh, I'm just. I, I I get it. I get not wanting to to dive in the deep end with people who like are gonna probably be a little mean because you yeah. know that's how card game shop people can be sometimes. Sometimes it can be a little bit elitist. Well, look, I, I look, the game the game hasn't changed that much in the last twenty years. I heard um, there was like a whole new thing I, I, for I, for bringing extra stuff. I in. I mean, there's like a couple of there's like a couple of new mechanics. So like, you know, when you started playing, you had your creatures. And you had like your mana system, yeah. And like you could get rid of one creature, like one creature to get a bigger creature in, yeah, yeah. So it's still sort of like that, except now you can take two creatures and fuse them together to make them into one creature. Oh, that sounds cool. Which, like, yeah, you you need like a special card to like fuse them together, but okay. and, and they've got to be like the specific ones listed on the target, but you can like make a new creature. Oh, oh okay. And then there's okay, there's another system that. It's going to sound like I'm explaining fusing monsters together again, but I promise it's different. Right. So instead of needing the named monsters and like a special card to fuse them, you need one that's like a normal monster and one that's like uh, a special monster and you add up their levels and like whatever that number adds up to, you can get a, a, a fused creature out of that number from the deck. So it's like just just add the numbers together, get one of that number out. Oh, oh, yeah, I remember this game being quite mass heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, this 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 yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I got this. Yeah, okay. what? Well, 
Okay, what, what else? What okay, else okay. well, we have a couple more mechanics that are, again, going to sound like I'm just explaining fusing creatures together. I mean, but... it's a very creature-based game. Okay. I remember that about Okay, it. so there's... Sometimes you'll have two creatures of the same numbered level, and you put them on top of each other, and that makes a new creature, and the creatures don't go to the graveyard that were used as material... They stay under the card and can be used as like ammo for special abilities. Oh, cool! Um, and I, God, I'm realizing how many of these mechanics are just fused two creatures together again. I mean, sometimes when two cute creatures love each other very much and hate your opponent an awful lot, yeah, they get together and they make a new more powerful monster, and it uses this uh onyx gem mechanic. Yeah. To launch the new, the old creatures by quantizing them at the yeah. the, the enemy, uh, and then yeah. uh, oh oh okay okay. There's more mechanics though. Right. Okay. Right, right. So you know how you used to only be able to get like one creature out per turn. Y- yeah, S- and unless you, they, I think there, yeah. was, there was some special rules. Oh yeah, there. N- yeah. There was spe- there were special ones. Now every single one is a special one. Basically, all of them are special. You can get as many creatures as you want as long as you have a very complicated maths line to get them out. But that's not even what I was going to get to. Right. Sometimes monsters are tri- are magic or uh, magic cards as now. Right. And they have so they do spells. Sort of. They have like two rule boxes on them, one for if they're a monster, one for if they're not, and they have a scale on them. Oh. And if you have a monster in your hand that its numbers fit between the numbers of the scale, you can get that as many of those out for free as you like, as long as the numbers are within the range. Right. I've also noticed the sticker sheet. We haven't got onto the sticker sheet Yeah, yet. no, we'll get to the sticker sheet. Um. Also, every card you remember from 20 years ago has been banned for being overpowered. So okay. none of the things you, the cards you remember, work. Oh, anymore. Oh. Also, you know how you used to have to play traps to be able to use traps. So like there was like an element of like ah, oh, I can see my my opponent's got a trap down. So like, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, some risk reward. Right. Yeah. No, there's traps you can just use from your hand now, so that like you could attack a person and they just have a trap in their hand and you didn't know because they didn't have to put a trap down to to trap you. Uh, oh, okay. Um, but I mean, other than that, it's basically the same as twenty years ago. Y- yeah, oh. I, I we haven't got onto these elaborate flowers over here. Oh yeah, no, those are used as part of like the um, those are used as part of the summoning ritual that is important in the like the the fourth main phase. I'm I'm gonna have to start drawing you a diagram. I'm really I'm really sorry that we're gonna need a diagram for this. Um, okay. So the the last thing you need to know. Right. Games usually last like two turns maximum now. Oh, okay. Well, that should be over fairly quickly then, I guess. Oh, no. No, the average turn is 45 to 50 minutes. It's fine. We'll ease you, ba- we'll ease you in. Loop me up! <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I want to see more of? What do you want to see more of? Brochure Justice Warriors. Brochure Justice Warriors? Yeah. Right, Larry. Right, Eric. How you doing? Oh, you know, uh... Phew. Tired, honestly, mate, and, and fundamentally a little bit broken. But you know, yeah, same, bear it up. You. Same, same. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the state of being at the moment. I think. Yeah, yeah. Is that? Is that? And you know, well, probably best to get it all looked at while we've still got an NHS. I right? mean, that's uh, too true. Too true. Yeah. Although you know, NHS doesn't really help with everyone. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm hearing a lot about people who were, uh, you know, struggling to get their uh, their hormones and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've been hearing it all across the board on that front, you know, yeah. either, either from like states in the US where oh, you know, yeah. fans are coming into the place and causing problems. Oh, or horrible stuff. Even, oh, yeah. even just in the UK where like, I keep hearing stories about like, oh, this uh, this gender clinic closed. Oh, yeah, we'll move you to the next one, but you've got to start your five year wait again, even though you were already being seen at this one. Yeah. And like, shit like that can really like fuck with people's ability to get the medication that they are already on and prescribed. Well, fuck with people's ability to survive in general, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's you know, it, it's very frustrating and, and, and difficult to, to survive in, in that situation, yeah. you know, especially when you, you thought you'd already got to a point where. Things were moving, and and to take you back to square zero again is uh, absolutely bullshit, mate. Indeed, indeed. But I, I, I understand why it's happening. But I've seen a lot of uh, 
conversations having to pop up from uh, trans folks about uh, about access to hormones and specifically like if if some of the bans that are currently coming into effect uh, keep going the direction they're going, the reality of some people having to turn towards things like DIY HRT if uh, things get bad and well you yeah. know there's there's a lot of shit that's uh, you know. M- not everyone is a chemist and no. uh, equipped to carefully and accurately create uh, compounds themselves in a way that they can measure and check are the way they're meant to be. Yeah, you know, it's... Which uh, is, like, you know, thing number one. E- e- even, you know, what you might consider a, a fairly safe experiment. Uh, it, can, it can go in all, wrong in all sorts of ways if you're not using, you know, properly sterilised equipment. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're not using the right kind of ingredients, if you made substitutions, or if, you know, someone online is just trolling you with a, with a recipe, you know. Mm. You, uh, it, with something like hormones, uh, potentially fatal if, if that goes wrong. Yeah. That being said, like, there are, you know, there are resources out there for people and there are people who have successfully done this. And if it does come to it, you know, I, I, I recognise that. But also, uh, this, this whole conversation has, has like sparked a lot of other side conversations recently. Yeah. Because, you know, it's all well and good being like, hey, if we share safe and like as safe as possible information about DIY, HRT, etc. Yeah. That information is um, not going to be equally... Uh, not everyone's going to be able to follow those instructions with the same degree of safety. And no. Specifically, or precision. Yeah, and and like, I've specifically seen like uh, I've seen I've seen disabled trans people raising like, hey, I am not physically capable of doing some of the steps that are listed. Yeah, uh, I've also seen a lot of specifically like black trans men going, if I am caught with testosterone I was not prescribed, that is a whole fucking problem for me legally that they are not going to go lightly on me. Yeah, right. testor- testosterone, uh, I mean, I don't know necessarily so much in America, but I know in the UK it's it's a controlled substance, and obviously that's a, a, a big caution point right there, and and that means that, you know, being caught with it at all is obviously a big problem, and, yeah. uh, you know... I, I don't know if if things are a little bit different in America, because as, as I understand it, I'm always hearing about, you know, men who have uh, got themselves, cis men who've got themselves a uh, testosterone. My, my understanding is it really varies on where you are. But, oh, or state but, by state. Or yeah. yeah. But like the thing that was annoying me is I was seeing a lot of like, it feels a little trans medically, the, uh, some specifically white trans fans going like, Oh, if you wouldn't be willing to DIY HRT, then um, you know, if it came to it, then you're clearly not really trans, and like, that, that shit's bullshit. That, like, that is bullshit. You know, I yeah. cannot stand trans medicalists. Yeah, because it's like, look, not first of all, yeah, not every trans person is on hormones anyway. Nope. Second of all, yeah, as we said, the ability to safely make uh, DIY medication is very much predicated on access to the source materials and the physical ability to do very careful uh, things and and be accurate with them. Yeah. And also is going to be legally more dicey for people who are already at increased risk of police clamping down on them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, all, and at that point it just becomes, you know, the an excuse that they would use to, uh, you know, Try and uh, cause uh, harm to someone. As as I saw, uh, as I saw uh, a, a black trans person point out on social media, you know, the second a, a cop comes into their home for something completely unrelated and sees uh, attempting to use beakers to create a chemical, they're yeah. going to go rug lab and start shooting. Like that is the kind of shit that yeah. like is specifically a much higher risk for some members of the trans community than others. And like, yeah. do not. You know, get uh, uh, essentialist bullshitty about you know people who recognise it is more of a risk for them to you know fuck around with with sorting their own meds. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's another thing that I had, uh, I suppose I hadn't really previously considered. You know, having a uh, home kit for this, I, I imagine you know there's a decent amount of equipment that is required, and if you you know there is any uh, heating uh, aspects of that or, or, or strong chemicals. There is a risk of of that producing, you know. I, I don't know. I, I, again, I am not an expert yeah. in this particular sort of manufacture things. If that is the sort of thing that causes a strong odor, you, it only takes, you know, your your already 
slightly problematic uh, white neighbours to go, oh, there's a weird smell coming out of there. I think they're doing... Yeah. I think there's a drug factory. Right, and like this is this is the thing is it's like there is definitely a degree of privilege in the degree to which you know a lot of particularly white trans fans have been like no 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 yeah of course it'd be no problem to start doing it. It's like well in in that case I would say to them you start making it. I mean you start making it I for mean, them. Some of, some of them are thankfully and and hopefully they use that privilege to as long as they're doing it accurately to help others and not just themselves. Yeah. Oh, that's your hug. Yes, mate, yeah. Oh. Uh, good hug, oh, mate, good hug. Yeah, good hug. Right, I'll uh, maybe go and have a nap, mate. Oh, sounds lovely. No, it's not. So, Laura. Yes? We done did a book. We done did a book. Do you want to tell people about the book? I, what well, we did? I mean, you, you could tell them if you want. I oh, could tell yeah, them. Well, you... Okay. Well, 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 you... well, I will tell them. Well, it's fine. Well, it's Who Hunts the Whale. It is Who Hunts the Whale. It's a satirical novel about the video game industry where someone gets their dream job in, in the AAA game studio and then goes, oh no, maybe this isn't so so ideal, but it's okay because there are friends here and we'll survive it together, maybe. Yeah. Uh, it's out now. It is out now. You can get it unbound.com slash book slash whale. And other book places. And other book places like bookshop.org. I think that's available internationally. I, I know in so. America, but Barnes & Noble have it. Yeah. I I imagine by this point, Amazon America have it. I know for a while they didn't. Yeah, but Amazon's fuck like em. that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> We're too good for Amazon. Yeah. Maybe they heard us constantly slagging them off. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's 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 a good book, and you can get it, and you can read it, and then you can maybe get a second copy for a friend or family member or several friends and several family members. You can do that. That'd be good. Uh, Laura? Yeah? Uh, well, well, where can we find you on the internet? You can find me and Laura Gibbons pretty much everywhere. Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, Patreon. That's the one that pays the bills. It's just Laura Gibbons. I've got that good unified branding. You do. What about you? I don't have good unified branding. That's why I have a link tree. It's linktr.ee slash chaniac. Uh, J-A-N-E-I-A-C. You can find my music. You can find my t-shirts. You can find... Words that I have written um, that aren't a book. You can find all sorts of stuff, uh, and you can find it all over there. You can even help support this show and all the other stuff I do and create and, and all the streaming I do at patreon.com slash stonedmonkeyradio. <sighs> you can help me get up to the good big numbers of, of numbers of Patreons. Imagine if I hit 50 this year. That would be <gasps> amazing. That would be quite a thing. That would be. That would be. And um, Smudge is here. I'm glad that Smudge is here. Uh, anyway, Laura, now that Smudge is here, that probably means we need to stop and have a pet the kitty break. <gasps> the kitty so break. will you sing us out, please, Tom? Until next time, be a stranger. <laughs>